My name is Rachel Maldonado. My website is rhmaldonado.com. Belief in the human spirit and desire to connect is the reason why I want to tell your story and mine. And I am Tommy Parker and Dara Rhoda in Montana. How are you guys? I'm doing great. We're doing great. Go. Cool. So, you know, I have not been to Montana. Tell me about this place. Well, we're from a very small town with 5,000 people on the Flathead Indian Reservation. Uh, it's a beautiful place to live. Wow. And so you've been there your whole life? Oh, uh, yeah. We've actually, we grew up together. We've known each other since we were six. Oh, my goodness. Wow. So six years old, high school, everything? Yeah, we went to, um, we went to school together uh, through um, like all of our lives. We had some classes together. Um, I tried to date Dar in high school, but she kept curbing my advances. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah. Wow. Oh, my goodness. And so, Tommy, you have this incredible story. You're a U.S. Marine. Yeah. Um, so after I graduated from high school, I joined the Marine Corps when I was 19. Um, and uh, the Marine Corps is the smallest branch of service in the military. Um, and I think, in my opinion, one of the toughest boot camps you go through. Um, when you join the Marine Corps and go to boot camp, you're not a Marine recruit. You're a recruit. You don't actually become a Marine until you go through a process called the Crucible. Um, and then at the end of the Crucible, they have this big ceremony with our soccer round and they hand you um, your Eagle Globe and Anchor Pin, which is uh, the sigil that is on the Marine Corps flag. It's kind of our symbol. Um, and when I received mine, to give you an idea of how much it meant to me, I cried uh, big man tears. I didn't, I didn't uh, ugly cry. But um, it was just, it was one of the proudest moments of my life to become that. Wow. Well, that is incredible. And Dara, did you know that he had done this and was a U.S. Marine? Yeah. Um, when he was training, he would be home every once in a while. And I would see him working out religiously, running on the side of the road. And then I actually got to run into him right before he deployed and when he told me he was going to be a front line in the front lines and in, in the infantry i was i was worried about him i said do you have a death wish um i don't remember so, that uh, i do i was concerned <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness you know i i would be concerned as well so then you know you go on your deployment and how did that go um so we deployed to sang in afghanistan uh, in 2010, which at the time was one of the most kinetic environments uh, in Afghanistan. Um, and then uh, December 11th of 2010, while well, on a foot patrol, um, I stepped on an improvised explosive device, uh, resulting in the loss of my left leg at the hip, my right leg above the knee, and uh, all the fingers off my left hand. Um, and also when that happened, uh, a guy that I now consider a mentor ran up this ridge line that wasn't cleared um, and and got me. And then when they loaded me out of the truck, I don't really remember this, but uh, he asked me how I was doing. And I said, thumbs up all day, uh, bro. And uh, I just, I think that that's a cool part. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you have this moment and it changes your life. You know, you have this injury and, you know, you had to recover. Yeah, um, I was lucky because, uh, at least in my early recovery, the, the local town rallied behind me. Like we said, it's a small town. Um, they held a parade for me when I first came back. Um, they, a lot of local people um, on Facebook and stuff changed their profile picture to me. Local businesses put um pray for tommy up on their their reader boards and stuff and uh yeah everyone rallied behind me yeah we didn't really know what was happening at first because we just we knew that tommy had been injured we didn't um, there was rumors that he was dead but then we found out no he'd been injured but we didn't know how extensive his injuries were and just the whole town really rallied behind him to show support for him wow Wow. So when you have all this support, 
and you come back, then what happens? Um, so early on in my uh, injury or recovery, if you will, um, I decided that I liked pain pills. Uh, and I learned quickly that the doctors would give me really as many as I asked for. Um, and so I started abusing them early on and um, that spiraled out of control. Uh, and I became an uh, IV and heroin user and uh, drugs quit being something I did and uh, doing drugs became what I was. And uh, um, resulting in the being incarcerated and uh, in and out of jail several times. And even to the point where I cared so little that when I was in court, uh, I was being scolded by the, the judge and she called me uh, a soldier, which is not what Marines are. And I stopped her in the middle of her, uh, her verbal assault and told her that if you're going to scold me, at least uh, um, title me the right thing. Uh, Cause I just, I didn't care what, I didn't care what, what happened? I went in and out of treatment eight times uh, to appease people around me. Like uh, all I wanted to do was get high. I really liked getting high. Yeah. So the years that you were doing this, your mindset, you decide that this is your life. This is who you are. You yeah. were thinking these thoughts. Yeah, I, I used. Um, like I said, drugs weren't something I did anymore. I identified myself as a drug addict, as a junkie. It uh, completely consumed me that my whole life revolved around uh, getting drugs, doing drugs, figuring out how to get drugs later. Like that's all my life was. Uh, I lost in the um, six or seven years that I did drugs. Uh, I lost a house that a nonprofit got for me, um, my truck, uh, respect for, or respect from the people that I looked up to that were family and friends. I, everybody, even, even Marines that the gentleman that carried me, um, when I got Cassie back and stuff, they all pulled away from me and, and quit talking to me because, uh, I wouldn't from their perspective, try to change my life. I didn't, I wouldn't try to be anything better. Yeah. So then I, Tara, when he's in your hometown, and you're seeing this descent what did you feel uh, it was it, i didn't realize it was going on for a really long time um but then when i did oh i'm gonna cry it <laughs> it just it was super sad to see and because we'd been good childhood friends and when i saw him the first time and he was Hi, it just, it was like I was meeting a stranger. It wasn't, it wasn't like it was my friend that I had grew up with. What she doesn't tell you is when she saw me the first time when I was high, I actually invited her out to coffee because <laughs> I wanted to hang out with her. And uh, she said yes, but it was just a front so she could get away from <laughs> me, who apparently, according to her, was looking at her like a wolf looking at a sheep. Right. Wow. Wow. Well, you know, Tommy, it sounds like the interest has always been there. Uh, yeah, she, yeah. He's uh, an incredible person. <laughs> so then, you know, how did you know, Dara, to help this man and to believe? How did you do that? Well, so Tommy um, reached out to me when he was in rehab. And last, last rehab he went to, and he was sober and I was so excited to talk to him again because he was the Tommy that I remembered growing up with. And he's just, he's so funny and he's just transparent about everything he's thinking, which I think is a wonderful thing. I really appreciate that about him. Not everyone um, likes him. Not, no, not <laughs> everyone does. Um, but talking to him just kind of became my solace and I think his too. Yeah. So you found each other and you're there for each other when you need it. Yeah, it was. Um, so like she said, we, we reconnected when uh, I was in rehab the very last time, but that wasn't the last time that I did drugs. Um, I got out of rehab and uh, we still tried to talk and everything 
Um, and I made it a week, I think, after rehab that time before I relapsed. And I had enough respect for for Dara and and her life and her children that um, I said, no, look, I I started doing drugs again. Uh, I really enjoyed our conversations, the time we spent together. But uh, I am I know what happens when I start to do drugs again, and I'm not going to be somebody that you should be around. Um, instead of trying to be uh, a man or an adult or whatever you want to add and try to be and try to get sober, I just tried to run away. And Dara said, no, I don't, I don't like that you do drugs, but I like who you are as a person. Um, and so I, I guess she didn't say she would tolerate it, but her willingness to be around me said that she would tolerate it, um, which triggered something in me that she did something that most other people around me with my addiction, even my family, because my family had gotten tired of my um, oh, I'm sober and now I'm using again back and forth. And uh, she didn't try to get me to change, didn't try to get me to stop, just said that she didn't like it, but was willing to tolerate it, I guess. And so um, it made me try to control my use and, and try to try to use less um, because a person that in my view had so much to lose by being around me, because I went from being elevated like we said in the uh the local town to being public enemy number one if you will because uh i didn't care and i did dumb things that made the local we were in a farming community and so you don't do drugs it, if you if you do anything other than work hard and drink you're looked down upon and so the fact i did drugs everyone looked down upon me yeah and dar for you you have this history, it's your childhood friend, and you care about Tommy. And how did you just know that I am going to be there and do this? So that's kind of a hard question to answer, but just because I think it's something that's unquantifiable might be the right word. I don't think it's something that can be measured, but just, I, th I think I saw his, his true self really, yeah. because he really, he felt like a different person when he was being, um, but I knew like I in his eyes, that, that other taught me, my, my friend from childhood was there. Um, and then, and then I really like who he is now as a grown man. Like he is, of course I like, he's my end all be all like, yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> you didn't like me when I was younger. I, was I did like you, but you were a little wild <laughs> and I, you made me nervous. <laughs> so. so was there a a flip in your mind, you know, something that just helped put you over the edge to say, hey, I want to get in control of this, the drug use and the constant rehab and, and jail? Um, it was a it was a culmination of a lot of things. Um that Dara really did uh, that reignited um, a spark of self worth in me mm. yeah, that I identified as a as a drug user that that's what I was and I put myself into a box that I couldn't be anything better uh, couldn't be anything worse I'm a drug addict um, and just uh, things that some people might say little but I I see as being huge um, that Dara did to support me such as I got. Uh, Dara took me to see my probation officer on Valentine's Day, um, and I got arrested, and she drove uh, an hour back home. Uh, I called her from jail and said I, bond said I bonded out, I needed a ride, and she didn't question it and turned around and came back to me. Um, picked me up, took me back, wasn't uh, grilling me or upset with me like other people would have been. Uh, she just cherished the fact that we had a few more moments together. Um, and. Uh, uh, I ended up being arrested again the following week. Um, and while I was in jail, uh, I got transferred to a small, we have a small jail where we're at. Um, and I was in that small jail. And because of how the jail set up, I had to be in isolation. Um, and the only human contact I had other than uh, the guards was Dara. I would call and talk to Dara a couple of times a day. Um, my schedule was literally wake up, eat, read, talk to Dara, work out, eat, read, sleep. Like that's all I did. 
Um, and uh, one day Dara and I were talking and uh, for anybody who's never come off of being a meth user, um, after when you're in the initial uh, detox phase, um, your emotions are like an exposed nerve. Like you have no idea when you're either gonna turn or go up or down or anything. And so uh, I was more open with her than I had been with, I think anybody in the last uh, decade, whether it was because of my injury or the game I played at drug treatment centers to try to make my way through it and convince them and possibly myself that I wasn't that bad of a drug addict and I had control of it or whatever. Um, and I made Dara a promise that when the words fell out of my mouth, I didn't even know if I could keep the promise. I had promised other people that oh, I'll quit using, but I told Dara that, uh, and this was after I had told her like, no, move on. Like I'm probably going to be locked up for a while is what, which is what I assumed. Um, and she said that she wouldn't. And I said, okay, well, if we keep, being a thing because we didn't even classify what we were at the time um i will never put meth above you i can make you that promise and little voice in the back of my head was like no you can't you have this I had this love affair with meth for the better part of a decade and she's not going anywhere um but later that night when i was brushing my teeth and looked into my little polished stainless steel mirror um i had what somebody classified as an honest encounter with reality. Mm. Uh, I looked at where I was and who I was, uh, and it didn't coincide with where I wanted to go and who I wanted to be. Um, I had no idea where I wanted to go or who I wanted to be, but I just knew that I no longer wanted to do what I was doing. Um, and I got a lucky break uh, with my attorney. Um, he worked a deal for me to go to PTSD treatment. And so I ended up being released about a week after that that in honest encounter with reality um but i had nowhere to go uh I, the only way for me to be released is i had to go stay with somebody that was willing to what did they, they do they an officer of the court something um where they they had to willingly uh tell on me if i relapsed or anything like that and i would go back to jail um i had put my mom my sisters everybody through so much stress that none of them they were like, no, I, I love him, but he can't come here. Uh, and I was like, okay, that's, you know, that's fine. I'll spend my time in jail and then I'll go to, and uh, I was talking to Dara about it. And she said, you can come here, um, yeah. which honestly kind of terrified me because uh, she has kids and uh, esteem locally. And I, like I said, I was infamous, if you will. And I was worried about how it would negatively impact uh, her life and um, her ability to co-parent with her with her um, ex-husband and everything. And uh, she was like, "No, I'm not worried about it. We will." But he so he had been so transparent and blunt with me yeah. about every detail. Sometimes detail I didn't want to know about his life. I mean, we had spent all of this time talking, but I I just truly felt that if if something were to happen, if he was to relapse or anything like that, that he would tell me right away and be truthful with me. And he had completely kept his addicted life, his drug life, all the way away from me. Like the times that he would come visit, he would make sure that he was sober. He would make sure that it was away from the kids. Like he, he just had done such a good job about being ethical while he was using my well, no, that's a, that's because so. drug addicts have ethics. Um, yeah, yeah no, actually, a lot of them do. I think I, not all of the time, but he's laughing at me. But he has a high standard of morals, even while he. So I just I had faith that that he would do right by me and the kids, and he did. But <laughs> and I was right. So <laughs> that that was another. Um, uh, rock in the wall if you will to use that analogy um to show her support that uh a woman that had so much to lose was willing to put um some stock in somebody that had been statistically a loser for the last better part of a decade um and so i i got released and uh, i didn't know what i wanted to do still um, I was afraid that I was going to mess up and, and 
mess up this or or something in the back of jail. Um, and so shortly after that, I I figured that I needed to find something to do. Um, with me being in a wheelchair, I'm retired. I don't have a job. Um, and so I picked up working out while I was in jail. And uh, so I started um, running. A lot of people laugh when they hear that. Um, in my wheelchair daily. And uh, I got offered the opportunity to do a race that I thought was only a half marathon. Um, and I say only because I didn't think there were any other options. I'm not sure how far 13.1 miles are. Um, and I agreed to it. And then I found out that there was actually a 5K version. And uh, I had already said I would do a marathon. And so I wanted to hold to my word. That's a big thing ever since I became sober that if I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. Because a lot of times when I still use drugs, um, I would say, I would sell you, I'd hope, you know, sell you dreams if you want to, but never fulfill it. And so um, I did the first race. And uh, when I did the, it was a setup in a lap system. When I did the first lap, uh, I told myself I could give up and I didn't. Second lap, same thing. And then finally, when like on the the final lap, um, I broke through the wall. Uh, and I had this incredible release of endorphins and dopamine and everything. Um, I felt high and it lasted for the the rest of the day. Um, and I realized that uh, I was now addicted to running. Um, <laughs> but that I did everything would be okay. But I will say this now that it did to everyone. The main reason I did drugs is because I liked being I I do it, anybody that does drugs that tells you they don't like being high hasn't taken a second and looking in looked inward to realize that like, there might be other reasons that they, they use it to try to feel numb, but there's no one that doesn't like it. Um and so I had found this this new outlet, um, this form of catharsis. Uh and so with that, uh, I have drugged Dara all over. Um, I've run seven half marathons and one full marathon. Um, and when I say I've drugged Dara all over, just to show how much she's continued to support me, like uh, we've showed up to towns where I have to be at the race at four in the morning and we get to town at two in the morning. Um, and she's still waking up, wakes up and looks like this. <laughs> and then takes me to the race and supports me and everything. And uh, yeah, she's been, if it wouldn't have been for her kindness and support, like I never would have chose to be anything else. Um, I was completely okay with living my life in a revolving door of in and out of institutions, um, most likely resulting with me spending my life in prison or overdosing under a bridge somewhere because I didn't care. I, I didn't feel that I had um anything to not to live for class I was uh, sad or depressed I'm not that type of person I just didn't feel that there was a reason to improve myself I'd never truly tried to get sober and uh, I hate to say this because it kind of downplays on other people's attempts of sobriety but once I tried it was really easy it, it is um and and maybe that's because of the way that we have and I say we that Nara and I have structured our life to where I would really have to make a conscious effort to go against what I have. I, I think um, at least three times a day I have uh, a euphoric recall of what it was like to inject meth. Um, those of you that, that don't know, this is, I think, an interesting tidbit. Uh, uh, when you inject uh, meth, it releases 15,000 milligrams of uh, of dopamine in your brain. Um, the only thing close to that naturally occur is when you orgasm, and it only releases 500 milligrams. And so um, I'm, I think I'll have that euphoric recall the rest of my life. It is, I've never found anything that matches it. But the, the worst times that it happens are at night when I'm laying up trying to sleep. Because she felt like a newborn, I stayed awake for a little while. 
And uh, when it happens, um, I just pull her tighter because I realize I would have to do, I would have to willingly give up her, my life, or the life I've built and everything in order to go back to that lifestyle. And I don't want that. I don't, the, the thing I yearned for the most when I was locked up um, was a woman by my side that wanted to be by my side, not because I had drugs or money or, or was beneficial to them in some way. Like when Dara and I got together, she thought I was broke and homeless. It was like the adoptive felon program. Um, and so uh, yeah. she's helped me uh, slowly build the bedrock to what I hope ends up being um, a, an empire of our lives. Maybe we never make rich and famous maybe we never um maybe i died at a young age that i had this close bond with somebody that doesn't want anything except me to be in close proximity to them uh, has been incredible so tommy i think that this is incredible this journey that you have and you truly do this for yourself you make this decision but dara is a motivation and she helps you and dara how does it feel to see tommy sober running marathons and truly succeeding in the wildest of ways how does that feel <laughs> how does it feel it feels like yeah, I, I know my eyes are sweating a little bit <laughs> <laughs> uh it feels wonderful there's so many beautiful things in this world I could compare it to, but I truly feel like he is the person I'm supposed to be with. And I, I, I know, <laughs> and I never would have gotten that if, if he hadn't chose the route he did. I hadn't stepped on a bomb and done drugs. <laughs> hey, we all, but we all get where we are by our hardships and hardships are what prompts change really yeah, yeah. agree so beautifully said and i have one last question for you what makes you feel alive you go first <laughs> uh what makes me feel alive is those beautiful moments i have with my family with tommy and Richard that remind me how wonderful the world is and then really uh, tommy and i spend a lot of time pushing ourselves physically um and and embracing the suck is a good reminder too because you feel so good afterwards you're like yeah i did that that sucked but i did it and that feels wonderful too so maybe those two things um and what makes me feel like is doing things that people say um i can't or or breaking the status quo for um that exists for people in wheelchairs for drug addicts for for whatever it is just uh going beyond what people perceive as possible um whether that's myself perceiving as possible i never thought i'd do a marathon in a wheelchair i never thought i'd do a marathon when i had legs and so uh, just going beyond what I think is possible. Wow. So I want to say this, and I'm going to try to say it without crying, but I want to say, Tommy, thank you for your service. And Dara, thank you for all the love that you put in the world. I want to thank you so much. And I am just incredibly grateful for your story. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you to Kate Wolfer for technical advice and Linroy Palmer Coleman for music.